Welcome to Book Tour, two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. The book that we're going to be talking about tonight is Provenance by Max Berry. And uh, here's a little bit about Max. He is the author of numerous novels, including Jennifer Government, Company, Machine Man, and Lexicon. He is also the developer of the online nation simulation game Nation States. Prior to his writing career, Barry worked at tech giant HP. He lives in Melbourne, Australia, with his wife and two daughters. And sadly had to cancel his uh, book tour, which uh, we were planning on going to. Yeah, that means I have a free night in my calendar, <laughs> which I can't do anything in because the whole world is shut down. So, Yeah, yeah. <sighs> That's something. Rob and I had plans. We were going to go down to the city. We were going to see if we could lure Max Berry into like lunch and like hang out and then go to this reading. Maybe, maybe we'll, maybe you and I'll have to do something that night. Maybe we'll have to, we have to do an old school book live or something in place of that. Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't even thought about that. All right, here is the synopsis for a Providence. From the ingenious author of Jennifer Government and Lexicon, a brilliant work of science fiction that tells the intimate tale of four people facing their most desperate hour alone together at the edge of the universe. The video changed everything. Before that, we could believe that we were safe, special, chosen. We thought the universe was a twinkling ocean of opportunity waiting to be explored. Afterward, we knew better. Seven years after first contact, Providence 5 launches. It's an enormous and deadly warship built to protect humanity from its greatest ever threat. On board is a crew of just four, tasked with monitoring the ship and reporting the war's progress to a mesmerized global audience by way of social media. But while pursuing the enemy across space, Gilly, Talia, Anders, and Jackson confront the unthinkable. Their communications are cut, their ship decreasingly trustworthy and effective. To survive, they must win a fight that is suddenly and terrifyingly real. So on previous episodes, um, I think we talked about how this was a little more sci-fi than Livius uh, um, is usually usually cares for. And so there was a little bit of trepidation there. Um, how, how did it how did it go? Um, uh, so uh, <laughs> here's what I can say. This won't make any sense to you. So. Uh, what I want to do is for a moment, I want to talk to um, Doctor Who fans. <laughs> um, so, again, that's you can just tune out for two, three minutes because you won't understand anything that I'm saying. So there are a number of Doctor Who episodes that start off like on a ship with people you don't know in like super sci fi kind of uh, a setting. And there's, you know, usually only a handful of people on that ship. And those are the worst episodes of Doctor Who ever. So once I got past the, the you know, whatever, like the <laughs> prologue or the first chapter or whatever it is of this, I'm like, oh, this is going to be like one of those really bad Doctor Who episodes. They're all bad across the board. There's never enough Doctor in them. There's always some kind of crazy shit you can't follow. And I was really, really concerned. Even after you tried to kind of put me at, at ease about it, um, I will say that you were right, and this was not a shitty Doctor Who episode. Hey, that's awesome. That's good to hear. <laughs> that's good to hear. Um, I, I, yeah, I was pretty confident, but I didn't want to, you know, take it for granted that you were going to enjoy the book. So, um, I just, I guess, the book starts out with um, not necessarily a prologue, but um, there's a chapter explaining these people going into. It's almost like um, like a VR kind of experience I'd say um but they're actually it, it, imagine if you're like in a physical space and then like the scene is populated around you as opposed to you looking into a virtual world like that kind of thing um mm -hmm. and what they're doing is they're watching uh their world's first interaction with this alien race which goes um pretty much as as bad as you could expect it to the, it's just a scientific exploration into space and they encounter um, some sort of life form and uh, they do the scientific approach of, well, maybe they're not hostile. We need to figure out what's going on. And they just get just torn to pieces by these by these aliens. Yeah, it's a uh, it's always cute because we also think, well, maybe maybe they're not hostile. And of course, if you're if you're um, watching a movie or, or reading a book, you know, chances are uh, they're going to be. So we skip forward a few years um, after the, the video 
um, takes place and we're introduced to um, the four people, as it says in the synopsis, who are going to be on Providence Five. And that's um, they have very specific um, job duties. So Jackson is the captain. She runs uh, she runs the show. Um, there is Talia, who is a life officer, which quite honestly was one of the um, one of the most interesting I, I would say probably creations in this book, because I don't know if a life officer is actually a thing. But basically, she's kind of like a therapist who makes sure that the crew has everything that they need, because um, they're going to be gone for four years. There's uh, Anders, who's a weapons officer. Obviously, I think that's pretty self-explanatory. And then Gilly, who's uh, who's the geek, right, the intel officer. He's the one that uh, collects all the information and, and the kind of documents uh, the actual, like, engagements and stuff. Uh, with these alien creatures. So the four of them are on the ship that is 100% AI controlled. And they're there essentially just to make sure that everything goes well. And like I said, more to document the ship is going to take care of everything that, that they need and that they need in this war against uh, this alien race. Yeah. And so the, uh, you know, the jump forward to, to the seven years is basically when this crew is getting together and being launched for the first time. And so we get to see the social media side of it that was mentioned in the synopsis where basically um, at, at home while they're launching, but also throughout their trip into like millions of years, like millions of miles into space, they're constantly linking back with the home base and doing little like it's like social media posts like little clips of them talking about their day-to-day -day life or you know the inspirational things that are happening out there so um even from the very beginning um it's obvious that part of like prop you know a bigger part of the the, the crew's um purpose on the ship since it's so so much controlled by ai is to um, like put on a good face for the people back home kind of to like to sell the mission to the people um, back home because it's kind of so far off and, and it's like intangible because they're just out there in space somewhere doing stuff that like um, the people in charge want some sort of public face of what's going on out there. And then we have our, uh, our aliens. Um, they're called salamanders. Um, they live in hives and there are, tens of thousands of them so very um you know hive like in their in their behavior it's it's not they're not going against one offs uh, you know like a, an alien in a ship like klingons or or anything like that these are um just a mass of creatures with very destructive powers through something called hux h u k s is what what we call them and it's basically a projectile that can rip straight through um, basically every material, steel, whatever the ship is made out of. So any really close encounter, no pun intended, um, with them is going to lead <laughs> to death and destruction for, for the ship and for humans. Yeah, and the interesting thing about the Huck, and this is actually kind of like a bigger part of um, why I thought the science fiction wasn't going to get in the way, is the it's, it's explained one time in the book what the huck is and why it's so um destructive and it basically these um aliens are shooting out some sort of like mini black hole and anything that it comes in contact with it just kind of fucks up because it's like a little mini black hole um and it's explained once and that's it they don't really talk about it after that so what i like is that barry does introduce some weird sci-fi stuff like aliens called salamanders with six legs that shoot little black holes at you. But like he doesn't linger on that or, or over build that part of the story. He kind of told you once and that's all you needed to know. And he moved on to it being much more about like what was happening with the crew. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, this is probably where we can pause and kind of talk about, you know, I don't know, I guess different types of science fiction, not not that I've been exposed to a lot of it, but some of it is overly technical and spends a lot of time on creatures that you have to use your imagination on. And I felt like the salamanders, like there was just enough explanation that they're just really weird looking kind of things that that it was just enough. Yes. Uh, yeah. Without. Yeah. And, and it wasn't 50 alien races involved 
it was humans. There's a small cast of characters. It's literally four people versus these uh, um, this this group of aliens. So there's not and not to spoil anything or whatever. It's not like an alien leader or anything that you have to get to know. It's it's this group of creatures that we don't know a lot about. We just know that we need to obliterate them before they obliterate us. Um, even the ship, so, uh, the ship is this AI ship, and and I'm. I'm very pleased with how much information he gave on the ship because the ship is super interesting, right? So it's all controlled by AI. It's self-healing. It's self-maintaining. And I think he did a really good job of, like, selling me on that concept, on how that works, without it getting overly technical, which this could have very easily done. So that's why I say, like, this was sci-fi that was very accessible. I I, I mean that. I don't know that diehard sci-fi fans um, – all. Although the story is the same for any of us, right? But I don't know that diehard sci-fi fans would necessarily be satisfied with the level of detail. Um, I think for those of us who just like reading good stories, there was enough there. Yeah, precisely. He he put it out there and um, let it stand on like the fact that you were supposed to like believe it, and like as long as you believed it, like that was that was enough. He didn't have to go into well this is a 13 book saga and then this one we're going to explore yeah he, he really let it um just be what it is and i think that was very helpful to like the flow of the story um so uh, what i want to say about the story itself once they get out there and they're in space they start kind of encountering um these aliens uh, along their their travels they kind of even where they go is is determined by the ai who who kind of calculates where they're most likely to run into the enemy. And so they, they have these encounters where they get called up to the bridge or whatever, and they all um, kind of lock in for the engagement. And then they see what the threat is and they, they see how many of these aliens are they're facing. And then they do a thing called a pulse and that just wipes out everything. And they're like, all right, that was good. We got 10,000 that time. And then that's it. So like even the engagements with the enemy, are for a good chunk of the book seemingly effortless to the point that like it, it's almost boring like you would think that this like super terrifying alien race that is going is out to to end um humanity like the the engagements would be more like heart racing or you know terrifying and then really it just comes down to the ship is so good at doing what it does that um, they don't last very long, and there's there's almost no threat at all. Right, which is what I think makes this a great story, because it goes back to being about these people. Um, and I say that in, in two fashions. So let me get just kind of a little bit back to the story. Um, that's how we see it, is we see a first engagement, and then essentially it's like two years later, and they've been asked to go into kind of like an uncharted zone, and that's what the, the synopsis refers to. They have to go into this area that is um, cut off from communication. So they can still, like, record clips and stuff, but they won't be uploaded until they have Wi-Fi, basically, right? Like your phone backing up your your photos or something, right? So <laughs> so they can continue to do that. But um, so we get a good grasp on who the characters are and, and a little bit about their personality types, what the creatures are. And then we fast forward a couple of years um, to see what the effects of being on the ship for two years has had on the, on the um, inhabitants of the ship. Um, and then, you know, what could potentially happen when they don't have communication. So really this story all breaks down to real simple. There's four people on the ship. There's four character types and how they're dealing with the things that go around them. Rob touched on something and I don't want to get too far into the story. You know, I mean, from a spoiler standpoint, but you know, he said, it's kind of boring and it is, and they have a guy on He's the weapons officer, and he doesn't actually have to fire a weapon. So, you know, he's struggling to, like, find things to keep him motivated and interested. He joined thinking that, A, he could make a difference, and he has his own backstory, and there's reasons for that. But he really wanted to be in the heat of it, and he wanted to kill aliens. But for him, the ship is doing all the work, and he's just a bystander watching it happen. So that's just like one example of like the effect that this type of mission has on that person. But they're millions of miles away in space with no way to communicate back to Earth. And I think that gives you a good kind of baseline for for what the story is like. 
for sure. Uh, one thing I want to bring up because it was mentioned in the synopsis is um, that the ship is decreasingly trustworthy and effective. So over the course of multiple years, um, I feel like a couple things happen when when things don't go super smoothly when they're um, confronting a group of aliens. Like if something goes wrong, uh, it causes the crew to second guess, like how well the the ship was created to do its job. So there are a couple instances where they're like, hey, what's going on? I don't know if we can trust the ship to do what it's supposed to do, um, which makes, which kind of sows that like that seed of like, wait, what's going on? Is the ship really, you know, doing what it's supposed to? Should we, what should we do about it? Um, and so that's interesting. And then there was also, I don't want to, I don't want to go into the whole thing because obviously it would spoil things, but toward the beginning of the book, um, Talia, who is the life officer who like Livia said was kind of like a therapist. I thought of her as like, like the, the HR person on the ship. Um, that's, that's all, probably a good way to, yeah. <laughs> when they all first got on the ship, the ship said, hello. Like there was a message that said, hello, when she got on and she personally took it as the ship was communicating to her, not like someone thought, Oh, it would be nice if it said hello when the crew got on. And so, um, there is a little bit of the how aware of things is the ship. It was the ship saying hello to us or was it just a message that said hello? So those types of things are brought into question as, as the years go on. And it's interesting because you don't know whether it's the crew just having a, like a, like a cabin fever kind of locked in reaction to just questioning the things around them or is something actually going on? So that was a, that was a nice part of the story too. Yeah. There are a lot of good elements that um, when you think you're getting into a shitty doctor who episode, you don't really expect <laughs> that, that I think Max Berry did really well. I mean, there's not a lot else that we can say about the story. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of recap, right. Four different personality types secluded in outer space with AI that they're not sure that they trust go up against creatures that they don't understand. Yeah. Like, I think that, yeah, I mean, it, it, it winds up making for, for a good story. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, yeah, like Livia said, we don't want to spoil things, but um, that that's... Uh... It sounds like the best and worst setup at the same time. It sounds like it could be just super generic, lame, like monster fiction kind of stuff, but it's not. He doesn't do that. Like I like the way that he focuses on um, the people on the ship and like their interactions with each other, but also um, like what the effect of everything that's happening uh, has on them. Yeah, I think he really he focused the story very well. Without saying too much um, about this other particular scenario, and I know you touched on it, there there is the quote unquote business side of this, um, the public face of it that I thought that he handled really really well. Although it's not a huge part of the story, it it, it lends that that realism to it that that isn't there because all of this is so far out of like our understanding and reach. You know what I mean? But the the motivations behind the missions and the way they're handled and stuff makes it a little, for me at least made it a little um, more believable. If that makes sense. Yeah, totally. I agree with that. Yep. Um, yep. The other thing that I thought he did that was interesting was um, the backstory that we get on the individual characters. Cause I think we kind of dip into everybody's uh, personal backstory at one point or another. Um, we don't get that until well into the book. And I thought that was kind of, good in a way because it, it sets up the story um, uh, without it, it lets the story gain a, a, a quick momentum without getting you bogged down in learning about an individual character and, and it kind of throwing you off the rhythm of the individual story so I thought that was good um, but we do eventually learn what happened to you know our characters before they got on the ship and in and, and Olton most of the cases, it was their previous experiences that made them want to do this or something like that. So um, good 
good building up of the backstory of the characters too, and a little bit of the history of what happened. Like we get a little, a lot more history of what happened between the aliens and humanity, um, kind of farther on into the book. So I guess if you're reading this on our recommendation and you're like, Hey, wait, I don't know what the hell they're doing this for. It does show up. Agreed. I don't think there's a whole lot else um, we can say story-wise. Um, I'll, I'll kick it over to, I mean, it's well written. This is the, the fourth Max Berry book I've read. And I mean, he's a talented storyteller and a great author. I mean, there's, my, my expectations were perfectly met with the the style of the story and the writing of the story. It's, it's exactly what I expected. It's really good stuff. Yeah. One thing I would say, uh, if you're getting into this because you love AI... <laughs> you're going to be disappointed because there's really, he doesn't spend a lot of time on it. Yeah, no, he doesn't. He doesn't. Um, even the AI stuff is kind of interesting and there's stuff that I don't know, maybe I, I don't know that it merits a spoiler talk for this one, but there, there is another point that I wanted to talk to Rob about that I thought was pretty interesting, but it's, it's, it's deep in a spoiler territory. So I'll save yeah. that for after our wrap ups. Um, we're going to have Max Berry on. So there'll be more talk mm. about this book. In the next episode of Booked, which will be up in just a day or two, depending on how quickly everything goes down with this. But until then, we need to wrap this one up. So, Rob, take it away, man. Let's give this some some stars, numbers. I don't even know what we're calling it anymore. I think or it's still stars. stars, right? Is it still stars? I don't I know. Think it's still stars. I have no idea. I don't know. I you know what? I guess I could. That was the thing that I'd left out in the creation of this new system. Um, here's what I'll say. Uh, it was obvious very early on in the reading of this book that it was going to be very um, easy to get through this book. Um, I think I read the first 70 or 80 pages in one sitting just as my like, like I like to dip my toe and read the first couple of chapters just to get to know how the story feels. And that was my dip was like 80 pages or something like that. So I was like, Oh, this is going to be, this is going to be a breeze. And I did, I read it very quickly. I think I read it in three sittings mostly because I made myself kind of parcel it out a little bit because I was easily a week ahead of schedule. Um, so it reads super smoothly. Um, I feel like Barry did a lot of great things to help um, the pace of the the story be really great, but also um, I just love a lot of the individual decisions he made about the way the story went. Like it was very character focused, which I thought was great. Um, it sowed seeds of doubt where it needed to with... Um, you know, uh, how the ship was working and, uh, what was going on with the individual, um, uh, the crew of the ship and stuff like that. And he didn't linger too long on the stuff that didn't matter, which would be like a lot of the alien stuff or a lot of the technology stuff. He told you enough so that you knew something was happening and he didn't go into chapters and chapters of the history of all this stuff. He just gave you what you needed and and let you like enjoy the story um and and it worked very well um i think that like a lot of the strong points were for a, for a book that i would say definitely lands in sci-fi it's not burdened with a lot of stupid sci-fi world building or or like alien languages and stuff like that it's very down to earth and the way he did this which i thought was brilliant was um, as we talked about before, this was something that we were kind of like the crew was part of the crew's job was to kind of market their mission to the people back home to kind of justify why they were doing what they were doing. And so everything that we were reading was from like the dumbed down perspective of what you would say to the everyday person about what was going on. So there wasn't a lot of weird, super technical mumbo jumbo or jargon. It was just... This is how your average person would talk about aliens. They would call them salamanders. They wouldn't classify them or, you know, call them some scientific name. They kind of look like a salamander. We're going to call them salamanders. So um, I think that was a really strong point of the book. And um, man, it, it just, it felt very well balanced. I think that you could take any element of, of the story and break it down. But I think overall, the thing that, that worked so well was um, a very well balanced um, story with a, with a handful of really, really good decisions about plot 
and characters and stuff like that. So all of that being said, on a scale of 10, I'm going to say stars, unless you want to go to something else, books. <laughs> um, on a, salamanders. 10 salamanders. Out of 10 salamanders, uh, I'm giving this 8.5. Eight and a half salamanders. Not bad. You don't want to know what a half salamander looks like. I think I read a description in this book. Uh, yeah. So everything Rob said, 100%. Here's what I'll add or maybe elaborate on. This book had, um, I think, opportunities to go wrong. And it just didn't. So, again, I opened up this book. I'm not thrilled at the setup, right? Because it reminds me of, like I said, I'll say it one more time, the worst episodes of one of my favorite TV shows. It had the opportunity through the social media aspect. I thought, oh, okay, here's a really cheap way to to do um, some storytelling through, you know, whatever clips on Instagram or whatever we'd be using in the future, right? And it didn't. I thought, here's a chance where we could be introduced to this alien race and find out that we're just like them and blah, blah, blah. And we spent a lot of time on that. And you know what? It didn't. There's an AI that's introduced. And I thought, great, here we go. The all-knowing AI is, you know, is going to be a big part of the story. And, and I'm not saying it's not. All I'm saying is it's not um, um, Chuck Wendig's um, Wanderer's AI, right? Is that in my book? Yeah, the Wanderer's. The AI? <laughs> yes, right, yeah. Yes, so... You know what I mean? Like all these opportunities to do stuff that I was expecting to for it to do and then to go poorly. And he managed to evade all of them. And what he built was a super well-rounded story. Like there's there's the the public aspect of this. There's these characters. There's a reason these characters are there. You know what I mean? Like you said, the backstory, all of it was just really, really well-rounded and tightly written without a ton of loose ends, without a ton of exposition, without a ton of all of those things that, in my opinion, could have gone wrong with this type of story. And they didn't. And, and you know, I, I don't want to say, like, this was a good book because it didn't make a lot of mistakes because I think the story is really good on its own. I just think that he could have done significantly worse had he have fallen into any of what I'll call pitfalls that, that I just described. So, um I really liked it. And and again, science, science, when there's a goddamn guy in an astronaut uh, uh, outfit on the cover, like seriously, my shoulders feel heavy and I'm like, Ugh, I'm going to struggle to get through this. But it was a super um, it, it was well written, but in that well paced way, like Rob said that I think I read it in like three or four sittings and it's not a small book. It's 300 plus pages, um, but it moved well enough and kept you engaged enough in the story, despite it being science fiction, taking place in deep space with no communication and everything else. So I really enjoyed it. Um, completely independent of Rob. I also ended up on eight and a half salamanders for this book. I'm going to do the math really quick on this. Um, that means our average, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Carry the one is yep. Carry yeah, the it's, one. it's yeah. eight and a half, eight and a half salamanders, eight, eight and a half salamanders. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so in, in case this is the first time that you're listening, um, there are one, two, three, four, eight separate categories that we rate from one to 10 salamanders uh, to get these. So the fact that Rob and I land close on things, like I, I think we like a lot of the same things and we don't spend a lot of time really diverging uh, on our ratings. But when, when you land on the same rating in this system, it, it's it's a little more. I don't know, it feels a little more solid, I guess, yeah. than the other way where we would just call out somewhere between one and five stars, right? I agree, yes. Um, obviously, we're not going to talk about what happened in the end, but I will say that um, one of the things that I always think is like, as I'm reading the book, am I going to, do I pretty much know where this book is going or not? And is the surprise good or bad? And I was just very satisfied with um, how this book ended up. Like it had, you know, everything has some twists here and there, but um, the twist that he chose and the ending that he landed on, I thought was just um, perfect for the story he told. So I was very, I was very, I was very comfortable and happy with like the book start to finish, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yep. So Max Berry will be on with us shortly. By shortly, I don't mean tonight for us. It's actually going to be early, early Tuesday morning for us. Shortly for you guys. Uh, these episodes shouldn't be too far apart. Um, so you'll definitely want to check that out where we'll uh, talk to him about Providence and uh, and who knows what else. 
probably, that's what we've got for books man probably a pandemic will probably creep into the conversation I mean, we might we <laughs> might i just uh it's the worst part like i just turned on the tv and it's just there all the time on every goddamn it's, channel it's everything it is and, yeah there i will so, tell you um, um there were two uh podcasts that i listened to regularly um and one of them is done by a friend of ours and i started listening to one and I was like, oh, fuck. They're, I know they're going to talk about it the whole episode. And I stopped after like three minutes and I was like, I just can't. I can't listen to people talk about the same stuff I'm hearing everywhere. Same thing with the other one. And then I go to my beer podcast and they don't mention it once, like the entire hour. And I was like, oh, this is like so nice. <laughs> oh, maybe if we were shit faced, we wouldn't talk about it either. Yeah, maybe that's it. Uh, hey, here's what I do want to talk about. So um, I, I've, I've had... Uh, a little bit of TV viewing. I finished this book um, much earlier than I expected, so I had some time to watch some stuff. Oh, here we go. Have you heard of the Netflix movie, um, The Platform? Um, in as much as I think someone posted on social media about it like yesterday or today, and I did not read their their post. Dude, this movie, um, I believe, is Spanish, like from Spain. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a very interesting concept. It reminded me, did you ever see Cube? No. See, you and I are so different on like the movies that, <laughs> that we'll watch. I was probably busy it watching very, Back to the Future. Yeah. It had a very Cube vibe to it, um, it, it for anybody who's seen Cube. But let me give you the setup. There is... Um, it's weird because I know the synopsis is prisoners, but they're not really all prisoners. Like the one guy's there like voluntarily. So they uh, they're in this, for lack of a better term, jail. That is, um, I'll just say that it's a lot of floors, like a hundred plus floors. OK, they're in a room that's probably like 20 by 20, maybe. And in the middle is this huge rectangle that looks down onto the room below you. And if you look up, it looks up into the room above you. So there's, it, this is all the way through this, well, probably like a giant tower. All right. And the gist of it is it's two people per cell. You're in that cell for one month and you're randomly put into another cell for, for the next month. And the whole gist of this is that a platform is lowered from floor zero into floor one and it is the most amazing spread of food that you've ever seen and you have like two minutes to eat food and then it lowers to the next floor and those people have two minutes to eat food and then it lowers to the next floor so you're getting the leftovers from the people above that sounded good for the people on the lower floors Right. Like there's we're, we're not sure through the course of the story how many floors there are, but you do find out pretty quickly that if you're past like floor 70, it's probably not good. And some fucked up shit goes on, like as you get into the lower floors. I mean, I I, I enjoyed the movie. I mean, I'm going to give it like a like a fucking like 10 salamanders for originality. Um, You know, the story was was pretty good, but I mean, a, a wholly original and uh and, and fairly disgusting uh, movie. So um, yeah, it, when I watched it yesterday, it was the number two movie on Netflix. I don't know how often Netflix updates. Have you watched Netflix lately? Um, no. Netflix now, as you're surfing through things, will tell you. And I, I don't know how far they probably like the top ten things. So like if you're just looking at like documentaries – like if you pull up that weird tiger one that everyone's talking about, I'm sure it says mm -hmm. number one <laughs> yeah. today. So this was the number two movie yesterday. Um, pretty interesting. It, it's it's kind of disgusting, but it's kind of an interesting look at um, at how things work in the world. I think I, I enjoyed it. Hmm. Maybe I'll maybe I'll check it out. I did watch a couple of movies recently. Oh, do tell. Um, so I was feeling like I didn't want to do, I wanted to do a little off the beaten path for me, which is like still way closer to the beaten path than, than you are usually. Um, but, so I don't know if you know, you never saw the movie, the big Lebowski, did you? I did not. Okay. But you're aware of it. 
It's like a cult classic. Yes, there's 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 a lot of bowling and a guy in a bathrobe. Yeah, that's pretty much all you need to know. So, um, John Turturro in the movie played a character called Jesus. He called himself the Jesus, and he was like a rival bowler. And he has a very bit part. He's not in the movie much. Um, but apparently, he loved that character so much that um, he convinced the um, the 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 Cohen the Cohen brothers. It's a Cohen brothers movie, right? Yeah, Cohen brothers. Um, to let him do a spin-off movie <laughs> based on his character called the Jesus rolls. Um, and I always knew it wasn't going to be great <laughs> because there's really not a lot of things you can do with, um, with his particular character who basically, just so you know, Livius, everybody else who's listening knows this, but I'm telling you, um, his character is this like, um, it's a he's this his character's Mexican and he's a bowler and the backstory that you get from him or about him is that um he did some time in jail um for exposing himself to a child <laughs> so he's not like a redeemable character in the Big Lebowski but some for some reason Turturro wanted to do a spin-off movie of this character and he did he made it it's called the Jesus Rolls what's interesting that I discovered only through some internet research is that it is essentially a remake of a 1974 French film called going places, which, um, at the time that movie got a lot of, uh, like it was an award-winning movie and stuff, but at the same time, people were calling it like the most obscene movie and stuff. Cause essentially the story is these two petty criminals go around randomly committing crimes and having lots of sex with girls. And that's basically the only thing that happens in the movie. (laughs) So, uh, he, he took the character from the big Lebowski and remade this classic French film about like petty criminals, like, you know, stealing and screwing, um, around that character. And he basically just threw some sprinkles of bowling in there. And, uh, I don't know. It's not great, but I think that it like the fact that I know that it was it's a remake of this French film just makes it a lot more kind of charming or fun, you know? So overall, I actually kind of enjoyed it. I will tell you um I I don't know, so I I pulled this up while you were talking about just I googled it and I'm a little confused cuz <laughs> IMDb has it at well so on the the right side of Google like when you pull up a movie right, it'll give yeah. you like the runtime and a couple different so it's got a 23% on Rotten Tomatoes a 4.3 on IMDb and yeah. then but in the actual Google result for it it says 2 out of 5 with a oh I guess that would be 4.3 out of 10 never mind so yeah 4 so yeah I I think that um a lot of people didn't didn't really care for for this movie. No, and um, I knew I knew they it wouldn't. It was never going to be a successful movie, but I liked it. Yeah. I thought it was funny. Now this was this was really straight to streaming, right? Like yeah. not Netflix, but like this this wasn't in a theater. This this just came out to like rental and purchase, right? Like on iTunes and stuff. Yeah, I believe there was no theatrical release. Uh, I could be wrong, yeah. but I believe there was no theatrical release. Um. All I know is when you said John Torturo, all I could think about was, hey, he played Condition Rounders, and I, he I was love Kanish. Totally Kanish Condition is, yeah. Rounders. Yeah. Um, yeah. See, I've seen a couple movies. I know. Like, yeah. So, fun story about Torturo. Um, my friend Jerry, <laughs> he was. Um, there's a hotel in Chicago called the Drake. Are you familiar with it? It's like right by the lake. I, I know of it. I've, I've never been, but yeah, I know of it. He was having lunch at the restaurant there or whatever, dinner uh, one time with, I think, his wife, maybe like their family. I don't know. Um, But at some point, someone comes up to their table and says, hey, um, I think my wife left her bag under the table or something like that. Do you mind if I look? And he looks up and it's John Turturro. Like he was sitting at the table that Turturro had previously been at. (laughs) and They thought they left something behind. So that's cute. Cute little story. I can't imagine running into Kanish at at a restaurant. I would not. I would probably, probably take it cool. Oh, if you called him Kanish. Yeah, like I'm thinking maybe he's done stuff that's bigger than that, but that's all I can think about when you say that name. <laughs> that dude's been in everything. Um, I watched another movie too. Oh, do tell, and then I'll give you a quick runoff of what I've watched the last week or so. Uh, 
So uh, this is the one that's a little bit more off the beaten path. Um, you probably haven't even heard of it. There's a movie called Guns Akimbo starring Daniel Radcliffe. You would be correct, sir. All right. So basically this is um, the setup of this story is um, there's this group called Schism. And what they do is they publicly broadcast um, like two different players fighting to the death. So it's like a death games kind of thing that's um, heavily social media focused because you're watching it online and you're voting for stuff and everything. Um, like, or not voting for stuff, but like the more viewers you get, the better of a player you are kind of thing. But basically it's just like two people fighting to the death and it's obviously a little over the top with like the, you know, how they dress, how they look, like the weapons they use, stuff like that. And um, Radcliffe plays this like nerdy kind of coder kind of guy who um, he's like a, a big time internet troll and he decides to troll the schism people. And then the schism people were like, fuck this kid. We And they force him into being one of the participants in one of these games. Like they put him up against one of their best and they basically bolt guns onto his hands. So he can't, he can't let them go. And they have like 24 hours or whatever. And one of them has to die. So it's just like a really, it's kind of stupid and basic and it's just really violent. Um, but I thought it was pretty good. It was better than I was expecting it to be. Um, the rest of viewers agree with you as it rates about 50% higher than the Jesus rolls. <laughs> it's definitely like violence porn. Like I think if you're into yeah. just a bunch of just gratuitous like shooting and stuff, it would be, you know, but Radcliffe is his, his character is funny. It is, uh, it is rated R for pervasive slaughter. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> yeah, that's just want you to pervasive slaughter is why it has an R rating. <laughs> um, that sounds a little more my speed, although I don't yeah. think I'm going to watch it. Um, did you know what Akimbo meant before seeing that movie? Akimbo, like, like splayed out all in different directions or whatever. Like, isn't that what that means? Um, you know, I, I guess, I guess I'm not sure. Um, all I know is that that's also called uh, akimbo is when you have two of the same weapon, like when you're firing weapons with each hand. So I guess I don't know what the actual word for that is, but the fact that he had two guns is why it's called akimbo. Oh, so I was thinking, so the yeah. dictionary definition with hands on the hips and elbows turned outward. Oh, that's, that's, that's what I was thinking of. Your elbows out. I don't know. I, anyway. I, yeah. I, I was going with my call of duty knowledge. But if you have akimbo guns, it's the same gun. Well, I mean, obviously you're right. <laughs> I was going yeah, yeah, on yeah, yeah. <laughs> my lack of my 100% lack of game knowledge. Um, all right. So uh, I, I'll give you kind of a quick rundown. I watched um, <laughs> quite a few movies in the last 10 days or so. Um, so I, I saw Pretty in Pink and Dream a Little Dream. And the Heavenly Kid, those were on like my '80s playlist, along with the Lost Boys, which I think I might have mentioned last mm -hmm. time we were recording. Yeah. If I remember correctly? So yeah, like the last ten days, I watched movies, and then I watched season three of Ozark over the last um, two days. Have you watched Ozark at all? Um, I watched weirdly. I watched everything but the last episode of season one. <laughs> For some reason, I dropped off right before oh, finishing right. season one. I haven't I haven't picked it back up yet. Um, I liked season three. I thought it was good. I think I liked it a little better than season two. Um, but I, I, I was happy that it came back and of course it came out on Friday and here it is Sunday night and I've completed um, <laughs> season three in true, um, you know, binge watching fashion. It was like eight episodes in a row yesterday and then two today um, to wrap yeah. it up. But um, yeah, if you if you liked Ozark, definitely check out season three. Um, I don't they're not as far as I know, like renewed for season four, but the, the potential is is definitely there. Yeah. Did you need my review on Pretty in Pink or uh yeah, why don't you throw um, some salamanders on some of these or... movies? Yeah, yeah. So um it's probably like a six salamander movie. Um I, I really love the Heavenly Kid for a cheesy um are you familiar with Heavenly Kid? Uh yes. I do remember watching okay. that. Yeah. So Dragon. I would give that one. like eight salamanders. Yeah, yep. Um I think gut racing, is that what they call it? I think they call it gut <laughs> racing because you race towards the the cliff anyway um and then uh, dream a little dream for for me it's like a little bit of an interesting take on like the body switching genre 
you know, the like trading, trading physical forms. With is that what that was? I don't remember that. Yeah. So it was, it was the, the two Corys, which of course watching Lost Boys is what led me to think of. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. Uh, Yeah. So in that one, there's a a weird thing happens and an old man inhabits um, Corey Feldman's body. So Jesus, if you could go wrong in any way in that kind of trade off, I guess being Corey Feldman is probably (laughs) the worst way that could go. Um, But like Corey Feldman does not inhabit like the old man, you know what I mean? So it's kind of an interesting, different little look at, uh, at that genre. And I, I, that movie just has a, you know, just a spot in my heart and has for, you know, whatever, 30 years or something since it came out. But yeah, so I went on a little bit of a, of a binge of, of eighties movies over the last couple weeks. Didn't we, before we get off Corey Feldman, you sent me that video, that music video that he did, right? Um, this is probably in the last like six months or so. Mm-hmm. I was scrolling through our messages back and forth. I was looking for something and I scrolled past the link that you sent. And I, I just, I love my reaction. It was just got to give it to him. He did all, he did that all in one take. Yeah. So I couldn't even shit yeah. on the Corey Feldman music video. Dude, Corey Feldman got so weird. And, and I don't know how much of this, you know, but he has been, um, he's been very vocal about Hollywood oh, just yeah. being filled with pedophiles. Mm-hmm. Right. And he has long alleged that Corey Haim and himself, but that Corey Haim mainly was um, the the victim of this. Yep. And he put together like a weird expose documentary. And, and I, I could be getting some of this wrong, but it was going to be like a pay-per-view thing. It was only going to air once, which is a little weird. Like if you really want to get the message out there, let me tell you the worst way is to put it so that people can only see it at a certain time on a certain day. Right. But then there were like weird technical issues with it. And I guess the whole thing didn't get shown. So now I don't know if that means that Corey Feldman's mm-hmm. full of shit or if like the powers that be, you know, get like a little, Hollywood's little Alex Jones here. Yeah. But uh, that guy, man, he, he has got like, he tried a musical career. It was like Corey Feldman Corey, and the angels or whatever. It's like these hot chicks like dancing around while he sang and danced like Michael Jackson. There's, there's. I'm sure that after his death, there is going to be a really rock solid documentary about this guy's life. Yeah. It's probably going to be really. Um, I don't know if entertaining is the right word, but interesting, maybe. Yeah, that guy is. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting. That's weird. Um, I had to mention that music video. God, I wish I knew the name of the song because I would tell everybody to go watch it. But just go watch Corey Feldman videos until there's one where he's like going through a house, and then you found the right one. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> maybe all of them are like that and i'm just wasting somebody's time i'm, I'm trying know. to open slack and see if i can find the <laughs> well people, but yeah while you're doing that i want to bring up um something that came to my attention um through social media josh mallerman you know the big thing with josh mallerman right now right yes uh-huh so i'll talk about that a little bit for anybody who's not aware so obviously since um bird box hit the scene we have reviewed every book, I believe, that Mallerman's put out that's been like a mainstream novel. Um, I know he's had other type of works and short stories and stuff that we haven't touched on, but we've we've reviewed a good amount of his books. He decided, I don't know how much planning went into this, but um, he, on his website, joshmallerman.com, is releasing a serialized novel, um, like a chapter at a time. Uh, I think last week... The first two or three chapters went up pretty much right away, and then he's been releasing a little bit of a to- a little bit at a time on his website. It says new chapters every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. There are currently six chapters available, and it is a novel called Carpenter's Farm. Um, I have not started reading it yet, but obviously I intend to. I've got time to do that. Just thought it was interesting that he was he was uh, taking some time out to just drop a book chapters at a time, which I don't think, I mean, I'm sure people have done that in the past, but it's not something that really rings any bells of, of anything that's happened recently. Um, I did see that it is on my list. Um, after I get through, um, our next review book, um, I, oddly enough, just cause I listened to our Max Berry interview from like seven, eight years ago. Um, Max Berry did that for machine man. And then it was kind mm. of picked up and collected and cleaned up into a, a novel. Oh yeah. yeah, It's a, it's, it's always fun to see, um, to see new stuff from Josh. Um, listen, don't be intimidated. Those first two chapters will take you about 12 seconds to read (laughs) as they're both very short, but then it gets into like more regular size chapters. I took a look at it. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to that too. I mean, and you know, 
Mallory coming out this year. Super excited to to see what uh, what happens there. Yeah, we will definitely be reading and reviewing that. The early reviews that I'm seeing for Mallory, by the way, like when you have something like Bird Box, which um, you know on its own we named the best uh, the best book that we read in 2014, um, and it hit tons more critical acclaim than that <laughs> beyond beyond us apparently. Um, beyond our five salamanders that we gave it at the time. Um, like you worry about the follow-up kind of the way that we were worried about Aaron Morgenstern coming out with a book eight years after night circus, you know, there's a lot of hype. Mm -hmm. Um, but the early reviews I'm, I'm seeing, um, make it sound like it's as good, if not better. So, um, I'm still going to go in expectations super low because that's that's i think how i stay so optimistic is because i just i don't think anything's going to be good so i let it be good and then surprise me um but early early re reviews sound very positive very very cool i have not seen or paid attention to any early reviews so that's definitely good to hear um ascension millennium by Corey feldman yes. i've been watching it the whole time we've been talking <laughs> since i found it in our slack conversation what a great um, song and a great video. It was, yeah, so. it was, a, it was a one take mm -hmm. um, thing. It was a one shot. It was amazing. And it, uh, yeah, there's a lot of action. So yeah. Yeah. Good it's job. always just weird. Sorry to go back to this. It's so weird to watch him like, like channeling Michael Jackson. Oh yeah. I mean, and, you mean straight ripping off Michael Jackson? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I like, I know they were friends, but this is the same dance he does in essentially in um, Dream a Little Dream, which I think was like <laughs> 1989. Yeah. But this was from 2013. So, at any rate, Corey, if you're listening, keep up the good work, brother. Hope you're safe. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I never want to hold that guy down. He, he needs to just <sighs> right. be his, fly his freak flag. Here's, uh, here's what's coming up next Max Berry. Probably now you can go listen to that. Next week. Um, we are going to be reviewing a book by Grady Hendrix, and I don't have it in front of me. I believe it is called The Southern Book Club's Guide to Vampire Slaying. Yes. Or Slaying Vampires. Um, so, or Slaying Vampires. Yep, yeah, that one. It. Slaying Vampires. Um, I got to start on it. Rob got to start on it. I am uh, very optimistic from the 40 pages that I read today. Um, so uh, I, I think that'll be another another fun, good book to discuss. I already like the premise quite a bit. Yep, I'm looking forward to it a lot. Um, did you read the, the the author's note at the beginning? I did. Yeah, it makes me kind of wish that I'd read some of his other stuff because uh, he mentions how it's not like the matter; it's not story wise tied to another book of his. But um, yeah, anyway, there's links. I also just wish that I've discovered Grady Hendrix earlier. I guess is what I'm trying to say. Agreed. <laughs> All right. Um, that's it. We're done. He's right. We're done here. Go listen to Max Berry's interview, and we'll be back uh, soon enough. Until then, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Keep reading. Keep killing salamanders. <laughs>